Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome back to part two of our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 39th Vice President of the United States, Spiro Agnew. I uh, hope you enjoyed part one yesterday, of course, taking a look at the early life and political rise all the way up to the vice presidency of Spiro Agnew. Uh, and now today in part two, we'll take a look at the uh, election that got him elected as vice president. Uh, of course, he was vice president under Richard Nixon. So we're going to take a look at that election. We're going to take a look at his vice presidency, his legacy, the controversy, his death, and then his grave site there in Maryland, of course, like we always do here at Dead History. And have somebody here with us today. Hello, Henry. Hello. How you doing? Good. Yeah? Yeah. What's new, anything? No, not really. No, same old stuff? Same old stuff. Same old stuff. So there you go, Henry with us, dropping in. Um, yep, you did a great job yesterday. Everybody loved your intro, Henry. Thank you, thank yep. you. Of course. And uh, yeah. We're going to get right into who? Uh, Spiro, the 39th Vice President of the United States, Spiro Agnew. Very good. That's right. The 39th Vice President of the United States. Should we get right into it? Yes. Here we go? Yes. <laughs> All right. 39th Vice President, Spiro Theodore Agnew. Here we go. However, despite Agnew's political value... Nixon was not about to allow him to have an active role in the formation of administration policy. From the start, Agnew was given low-level assignments, kept out of the limelight, and given only limited access to the president. Agnew himself made the situation worse by exhibiting a decided lack of political tact. As the first man since Calvin Coolidge to step directly to the vice presidency from a state house, it was logical that he be put in charge of relations with other state executives. The Office of Intergovernmental Relations was thus created as part of the office of the vice president in 1969. However, Agnew was far from diplomatic in his dealings with his former colleagues. Rockefeller simply refused to talk with him, sending his messages to Nixon through National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger. As chair of a space advisory committee, Agnew's dogged support of a costly manned mission to Mars angered the White House. As a statutory member of the National Security Council, he advocated the immediate bombing of the Viet Cong sanctuaries in Cambodia and Laos. This belief mirrored Nixon's own, but Agnew was so strident about his support that Nixon, feeling that he had been overshadowed by an advisor, cut Agnew out of the foreign policy loop for the rest of the administration. The CIA even reported that while in while on an African trip, Agnew had told leaders that he opposed Nixon's overtures to the People's Republic of China. Agnew did make one solid contribution to the administration's policy, sharing Nixon's belief of Indian self-determination. Agnew's National Council on Indian Opportunity Committee officially proposed the establishment of an Indian revenue sharing program in October of 1971, a plan that was supported by the Department of the Interior and eventually adopted. But this was not enough. By 1970, Nixon was openly speculating with his aides about getting rid of Agnew by naming him to the Supreme Court. Then, he could name John Connolly, Nixon's choice as his heir apparent vice president. So, Henry, mm -hmm. 
Mm hmm. <laughs> That's it. You're a man of few words. So, did you hear that guy I just mentioned, Henry Kissinger? Uh-huh. Same name, as, first name as you? Mm-hmm. So, he was like, he's a diplomat. He served as uh, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor. You know, he, he, he served a couple different roles in administrations. So, this is back in, like, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford days. Okay. He's still alive. Yeah. Is he? He's 98 years old. Yeah, I just looked it up. Henry Kissinger is still alive. His birthday is actually May 27th. In like a month, he's going to be 99. 99 in one month. Right? That's older than John Tyler's right now. Yeah, it is older yeah. than John Tyler's John grandson. grandson. That's a really good call. John Tyler, who still has a living grandson, is not even 99, I don't believe. I think he's like 95 or something like that, or 96. uh, I think 97 or something. Uh, Okay, yeah. But yeah, Henry Kissinger's older than that. Can you believe that? I know, it's crazy. Crazy stuff. All right, here we go, moving on. So then, of course, we take a look at the 1968 presidential election. That is the election that got Richard Nixon elected as president. And, of course, Spiro Agnew elected as vice president. Uh, Very close context, uh, this 68 election. So Nixon was a Republican, uh, of course, running mate Spiro Agnew, uh, going up against the Democrat Hubert Humphrey uh, and his running mate Edmund Muskie. And then the Independent Party, third-party candidate, George Wallace, with his running mate, Curtis LeMay. The electoral vote count was 301 to 191 to 46 in favor of Nixon and Agnew. They carried 32 states, but only 43.4% of the popular vote for Nixon and Agnew. Humphrey and uh, Muskie had 42.7% of the popular vote. So you're talking an extremely close contest. This was not any sort of, I mean, it was a razor thin margin, but Nixon and Agnew did win 1968. uh, And that is how Spiro Agnew became the 39th vice president of the United States. So of course you're taking a look at some maps, some, you know, campaign posters or slogans, that sort of thing that I always like to do here when we take a look at, uh, you know, every subject. I always like to take a look at the election that got them elected into office. So there you go, guys. The 1968 United States presidential election where Spiro Agnew was elected vice president under President Richard Nixon. There you go. Learning the constraints of the office. Although Nixon had chosen a running mate who would not outshine him, he had pledged to give his vice president a significant policy-making role and for the first time in office in the West Wing of the White House. Nixon also encouraged Agnew to use his position as presiding officer of the Senate to get to know the members of Congress in order to serve as their liaison with the White House, and Agnew enthusiastically charged up Capitol Hill. Having had no previous legislative experience, he wanted to master the techniques of presiding over the Senate. For the first months of his vice presidency, he met each morning with the Senate parliamentarian, Floyd Riddick, to discuss parliamentary procedures and precedents. He took pride in administering the oath to the new senators by never having to refer to a note, Riddick observed. He would study and memorize these things so that he could perform without reading. According to Riddick, at first, Agnew presided more frequently than had any vice president since Albin Barkley. I was prepared to go in there and do a job as the president's representative in the Senate, said Agnew. 
who busily learned to identify the senators by name and face. Yet, he quickly discovered the severe constraints on his role as presiding officer. Agnew had prepared a four-minute speech to give in response to a formal welcome from Majority Leader Mike Mansfield. When Mansfield moved that the new president be given only two minutes to reply, Agnew felt it was like a slap in the face. The vice president also unwittingly broke precedent by trying to lobby on the Senate floor. During the debate over the ABM, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, Agnew approached Idaho Republican Senator Len Jordan and asked how he was going to vote. You can't tell me how to vote, said the shocked senator. You can't twist my arm. At the next luncheon of Republican senators, Jordan accused Agnew of breaking the separation of powers by lobbying on the Senate floor and announced The Jordan Rule, whereby if the vice president tried to lobby him on anything, he would automatically vote the other way. And so, Agnew concluded from the experience, after trying for a while to get along with the Senate, I decided I would go down to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and try playing the executive game. The vice president fit in no better at the White House than at the Capitol. Nixon's highly protective staff concluded that Agnew had no concept of his role, especially in relation to the president. Nixon found their few private meetings dismaying because of Agnew's constant self aggrandizement. Aggrandizement or aggrandizement, I think it is. Not really sure um, what that word is, to be honest. Aggrandizement is how it's pronounced. Self-aggrandizement. It's basically the act of making something larger or greater. So, you know, kind of overplaying things or uh, over-hyping things, I, I should say. Nixon told his staff that as vice president, he rarely had made any requests of President Dwight Eisenhower. But Agnew's visits always included demands for more staff, better facilities, more prerogatives, and prerequisites. The anticipated use of Agnew as a conduit to the nation's mayors and governors floundered when it became apparent that Agnew did nothing more than pass their gripes along to the president. When Agnew protested that Nixon did not see enough of his cabinet, Nixon grumbled that his vice president had become an advocate for all the crybabies in the cabinet who wanted to plead their special causes. Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Hattleman, took Agnew aside and advised him that the president does not like you to take an opposite view at a cabinet meeting or say anything that can be construed to be mildly not in accord with his thinking. Nixon appointed Agnew head of the National Aeronautics and Space Council, but again found the vice president more irritant than asset. In April of 1969, while at Camp David, Nixon summoned Hattleman to complain that the vice president had telephoned him simply to lobby for a candidate for director of the Space Council. He just has no sensitivity or judgment about his relationship with the president, Hattleman noted. After Agnew publicly advocated a space shot to Mars, Nixon's chief domestic advisor, John Ehrlichman, or Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman, tried to explain to him the facts of fiscal life. Look, Mr. Vice President, we have to be practical. There is no money for a Mars trip. The president has already decided that. So the president does not want such a trip in the Space Council's recommendation. It's your job to make absolutely certain that the Mars trip is not in there. From such experiences, the White House staff concluded that Agnew was not a Nixon team player. Unleashing Agnew. Throughout his first term, 
President Nixon was preoccupied with the war in Vietnam. By the fall of 1969, Nixon came to the unhappy conclusion that there would be no quick solution in Vietnam and that it would steadily become his war rather than Lyndon Johnson's. On November 3rd, Nixon delivered a television address to the nation in which he called for public support for the war until the communists negotiated an honorable peace. Public reaction to the speech was generally positive, but the Nixon family was livid with anger over the critical commentary by various network broadcasters. Nixon feared that the constant pounding from the media and our critics in Congress would eventually undermine his public support. As president, he wanted to follow the Eisenhower model of remaining above the fray and to use Agnew for the kind of hatchet work that he himself had done for Ike. When his speechwriter Pat Buchanan proposed that the vice president give his speech attacking network commentators, Nixon liked the idea. H.R. Hadleman went to discuss the proposed speech with the vice president, who was interested, but felt it was a bit abrasive. Nevertheless, the White House staff believed the message needed to be delivered, and he's the one to do it. Agnew already had some hard-hitting speeches under his belt. On October 20th of 1969, at a dinner in Jackson, Mississippi, he had, had attacked liberal intellectuals for their masochistic compulsion to destroy their country's strength. On October 30th in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he called student radicals and other critics of the war impudent snobs. On November 11th in Philadelphia, he decried the intolerant clamor and cacophony that raged in society. Then on November 13th in Des Moines, Iowa, he gave Buchanan's blast at the network news media. Hattleman recorded in his diary that as the debate on Agnew mounted, the president was fully convinced he's right and that the majority will agree. The White House sent word for the vice president to keep up the offensive and to keep speaking, noting that he was now a major figure in his own right. The vice president had become Nixon's Nixon. Agnew relished the attention showered upon him. He had been frustrated with his assignment as liaison with the governors and mayors and dealing with taxation, health, and other substantive issues had required tedious study. By contrast, he found speech-making much more gratifying. As John Ehrlichman sourly noted, Agnew could take the text prepared in the president's speech-writing shop, change a phrase here and there, and hit the road to attack the effete corpse of impudent snobs. His colorful phrases like nattering nabobs of negativism and radicalibs for radical liberals were compiled and published as common sense quotations. I have refused to cool it, to use the vernacular, Agnew declared, until the self-righteous lower their voice a few decibels. I intend to be heard over the din, even if it means raising my voice. The Agnew Upsurge The Agnew Upsurge fascinated President Nixon, who took it as evidence that a new conservative coalition could be built between blue-collar ethnic voters and white-collar suburbanites. Nixon believed that Agnew was receiving increasing press coverage because his attacks on the media forced them to pay attention. When some of his advisors wanted to put Agnew out in front in opposition to expanded school 
desegregation, Nixon hesitated because he did not want to dilute or waste the great asset he has become. By March of 1970, the relationship between the president and vice president reached its apex when the two appeared for an amusing piano duet at the Gridiron Club. No matter what tunes Nixon tried to play, Agnew would drown him out with Dixie until they both joined in God Bless America as a finale. As the strains of their duet faded, Nixon began having second thoughts and concluded that he needed to change the Agnew approach. He informed Hadelman that the vice president had become a better salesman for himself than for the administration, emerging as too much of an issue and a personality himself. That month, when the Apollo 13 astronauts had to abort their mission and return to Earth, Hadelman worked frantically to keep Agnew from flying to Houston and upstaging the president. Agnew sat in his plane on the runway for over an hour till Nixon finally canceled the trip. VP mad as hell, Hadelman noted, but agreed to follow orders. In May of 1970, after National Guardsmen shot and killed four students at Kent State University, Nixon cautioned Agnew not to say anything provocative about students. Word leaked out that the president was trying to muzzle his vice president. The next time Buchanan prepared a hot new Agnew speech, Nixon felt more leery than before. By the summer of 1970, Nixon pondered how best to use Agnew in that fall's congressional elections. The president himself wanted to remain remote from partisanship and limit his speaking to foreign policy issues while Agnew stumped for candidates. Nixon worried that if Agnew continued to appear an unreasonable figure using highly charged rhetoric, he might hurt rather than help the candidates for whom he campaigned. Do you think Agnew's too rough? Nixon asked John Ehrlichman one day. His style isn't the problem. It's the content of what he says. He's got to be more positive. He must avoid all personal attacks on people. He can take on Congress as a unit, not as individuals. Some Republican candidates even asked Agnew to stay out of their states. As the campaign progressed, Agnew's droning on about law and order diminished his impact. Nixon felt compelled to abandon his presidential aloofness and enter the campaign himself, barnstorming around the country as Attorney General John Mitchell complained like a man running for sheriff. The disappointing results of the midterm elections, Republicans gained two, ha two seats, sorry, Republicans gained two seats in the Senate, but lost a dozen in the House, further shook Nixon's confidence in Agnew. The number one hawk. In 1971, the president devoted most of his attention to foreign policy, planning his historic visit to China, a summit in Moscow, and continued peace talks with the North, North Vietnamese in Paris. The vice president went abroad for a series of goodwill tours and ached for more involvement in foreign policy, an area that Nixon reserved exclusively for himself and national security advisor Henry Kissinger. Nixon preferred that Agnew limit himself to attacking the media to soften the press for his foreign policy initiatives. He decided to keep the vice president out of all substantive policy decisions since Agnew seemed incapable of grasping the big picture. For his part, Agnew complained that he was never allowed to come close enough to Nixon to participate in, in 
any policy discussions. Every time I went to see him and raised the subject for discussion, the vice president later wrote, he would begin a rambling, time-consuming monologue. Agnew, who described himself as the number one hawk, went so far as to criticize Nixon's ping-pong diplomacy with the People's Republic of China. The dismayed president considered Agnew a bull in the diplomatic China shop. Nixon had H.R. Hattleman lecture the vice president on the importance of using the China thaw to get the Russians shook. It is beyond my understanding, Nixon told Ehrlichman. Twice Agnew has proposed that he go to China. Now he tells the world it's a bad idea for me to go. What am I going to do about him? The Connolly Alternative By mid-1971, Nixon concluded that Spiro Agnew was not broad-gauged enough for the vice presidency. He constructed a scenario by which Agnew would resign, enabling Nixon to appoint Treasury Secretary John Connolly as vice president under the provisions of the 25th Amendment. By appealing to Southern Democrats, Connolly would help Nixon create a political realignment, perhaps even replacing the Republican Party with a new party that could unite all conservatives. Nixon rejoiced at news that the vice president, feeling sorry for himself, had talked about resigning to accept a lucrative offer in the private sector. Yet, while Nixon excelled in daring, unexpected moves, he encountered some major obstacles to implementing this scheme. John Connolly was a Democrat, and his selection might offend both parties in Congress, which under the 25th Amendment had to ratify the appointment of a new president. Even more problematic, John Connolly did not want to be vice president. He considered it a useless job and felt he could be more effective as a cabinet member. Nixon responded that the relationship between the president and vice president depended entirely on the personalities of whoever held those positions, and he promised Connolly they would make it a more meaningful job than ever in its history, even to the point of being an alternate president. But Connolly declined, never dreaming that the post would have made him president when Nixon was later forced to resign during the Watergate scandal. Nixon concluded that he would not only have to keep Agnew on the ticket, but must publicly demonstrate his confidence in the vice president. He recalled that Eisenhower had tried to drop him in 1956 and believed the move had only made Ike look bad. Nixon viewed Agnew as a general liability, but backing him could mute criticism from the extreme right. Attorney General John Mitchell, who was to head the re-election campaign, argued that Agnew had become almost a folk hero in the South and warned that party workers might see his removal as a breach of loyalty. As it turned out, Nixon won re-election in 1972 by a margin wide enough to make his vice presidential candidate irrelevant. Immediately after his re-election, however, Nixon made it clear that Agnew should not become his eventual successor. The president had no desire to slip into lame duck status by allowing Agnew to seize attention as the frontrunner in the next election. By any criteria, he falls short, the president told Ehrlichman. Energy, he doesn't work hard. He likes to play golf. Leadership, Nixon laughed. 
consistency, he's all over the place. He's not really a conservative, you know? Nixon considered placing the vice president in charge of the American Revolution Bicentennial as a way of sidetracking him. But Agnew declined the post, arguing that the Bicentennial was a loser because everyone would have a different idea about how to celebrate the Bicentennial. Its director would have to disappoint too many people. A potential presidential candidate, Agnew insisted, doesn't want to make any enemies. However, as much as he would have liked to have done so, Nixon was not able to rid himself of Agnew. By mid-1970, it was clear that Nixon was losing support of the conservative wing of the Republican Party, largely due to its opposition to detente with China and the Soviet Union. Despite Nixon's problems, Agnew found a home in the right wing, thanks to some of the most inflammatory rhetoric of the modern political period. Unneeded in Washington, Agnew hit the road, using speeches largely crafted by Buchanan. His first target was what he perceived to be a growing permissiveness on the part of the U.S. middle class toward their children. At the University of Utah in May of 1969, he railed against the dress of college students. I didn't raise my son to be a daughter. The next month at Ohio State, Agnew charged that any society that feared its young was effete. Later that fall in New Orleans, he attacked the effete core of impudent snobs. Uh, or impudent, I'm sorry. The effete core of impudent snobs who were teaching in the colleges and universities and poisoning the minds of the nation's young. These liberals soon were labeled with one of the most famous of the Agnewisms, Radiclibs. But his most famous attack came in November of 1969, when Agnew turned on the nation's broadcast media. In a speech at the Midwest Republican Conference held in Des Moines, Agnew savaged a media whose minds were made up in advance on Nixon's Vietnam policies. Agnew charged the networks with a conspiracy to slant the news through a handful of commentators who admit their own set of biases and encouraged like-minded people to call in and voice their support of his attack. All three networks were flooded with phone calls and telegrams. Agnew had become a celebrity. The American people would rightly not tolerate this concentration of power in government. Is it not fair and relevant to question its concentration in the hands of a tiny enclosed fraternity of privileged men elected by no one and enjoying a monopoly sanctioned and licensed by government, the views of a majority of this fraternity do not, and I repeat, not represent the views of America. Perhaps the place to start looking for a credibility gap is not in the offices of the government in Washington, but in the studios of the networks in New York. How many marches and demonstrations would we have if the marchers did not know that the other faithful TV cameras would be there to record their antics for the next week? The student now goes to college to proclaim rather than to learn. The lessons of the past are ignored and obliterated in a contemporary antagonism known as the generation gap. A spirit of national masochism prevails, encouraged by 
an effete core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves as intellectuals. A law-abiding American who believes in his country needs a strong voice to articulate his dissatisfaction with those who seek to destroy our heritage of liberty and our system of justice. To penetrate the cacophony of seditious drivel emanating from the best publicized clowns in our society and their fans in the fourth By July of 1970, Several Republican congressional candidates, including Robert Taft of Ohio, publicly stated that they did not want Agnew campaigning for them in the off-year elections that fall. But Nixon wanted Agnew on the campaign trail. Using Agnew as the administration's chief campaign surrogate would allow Nixon to stay in Washington and avoid the political fray. It would also allow the administration to strike out at Republicans who had criticized the administration's policy on Vietnam without involving the president. With Buchanan at his side, the vice president plunged into the first substantive substantive job given him by Nixon since their election. As he had been in 1968, Agnew was both coarse and effective. His attacks on anti-war New York Republican Senator Charles Goodell were so stinging in a reference to the first person who had undergone a sex change operation, Agnew called Goodell the Christine Jorgensen of the Republican Party. That they brought private complaints from Republican Party leaders like Ford. Regardless of Ford's objections, Goodell lost his race, and the White House was ecstatic. Agnew played a large part for the administration in keeping its off-year losses to a minimum that fall. Agnew's worth to the Nixon administration was clearly as a campaigner who galvanized the far right with his outlandish oratory. Despite his belief that his vice president was not up to the job, Nixon was quick to announce during a January 2nd, 1972 televised interview with CBS's Dan Rather that Agnew would stay on the ticket that fall. During the campaign, Agnew went after Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern, calling him one of the greatest frauds ever to be considered as a presidential candidate by a major American party. Agnew also followed Democrat vice presidential contender Sergeant Shriver from city to city, answering the speeches of the former director of the Peace Corps with speeches that specialized in claiming that Shriver's position on the ticket was a result of his being an in-law of liberal Senator Edward M. Kennedy. Agnew's invective was less necessary in 1968 than in 1972. The Republican ticket won with 60.7% of the popular vote. It also did not earn for him a place at Nixon's side during the second term. Quite the contrary, because the Constitution disqualified him from seeking a third term, Nixon no longer needed Agnew to rally the conservatives on the campaign trail. Immediately following the campaign, any access he may have had to Nixon virtually disappeared. Agnew was stripped of the Office of Intergovernmental Relations and virtually shut out of White House councils. Yet Agnew soon had much greater worries than lack of access. In Baltimore, U.S. Attorney George Beal had found evidence that real estate developers in and around Baltimore County had been paying kickback money to Agnew since 1962. The payments began as a quid pro quo for lucrative building contracts, but one developer, Lester Matz, fell behind and at least two installments were delivered to Agnew 
after he became vice president. Throughout the spring of 1973, Agnew had heard the rumors of an investigation, but the Watergate revelations had spurred the press to new heights of investigative reporting. Agnew dared not interfere with the investigation, lest an enterprising reporter pick up the scent. Impeachment insurance. Unbeknownst to both Nixon and Agnew, time was running out for both men's political careers. Since the previous June, the White House had been preoccupied with containing the political repercussions of the Watergate burglary in which individuals connected with the president's re-election committee had been arrested while breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Although Watergate did not influence the election, persistent stories in the media and the launching of a Senate investigation spelled trouble for the president. Innocent of any connection to Watergate, Agnew spoke out, spoke out in Nixon's defense. Then, on April 10th of 1973, the vice president called Hadleman to his office to report a problem of his own. The U.S. attorney in Maryland investigating illegal campaign contributions and kickbacks had questioned Jerome Wolf, Agnew's former aide. Wolf had kept verbatim accounts of meetings during which Agnew discussed raising funds from those who had received state contracts. Agnew swore that it wasn't shakedown stuff. It was merely going back to get support from those who had benefited from the administration. Since Prosecutor George Beale was the brother of Maryland Republican Senator J. Glenn Beale, Agnew wanted Haldeman to have Senator Beal intercede with his brother, a request that Haldeman wisely declined. President Nixon was not at all shocked to learn that his vice president had become enmeshed in a bribery scandal in Maryland. At first, Nixon took the matter lightly, remarking that taking campaign contributions from contractors was a common practice in Maryland and other states. Thank God I was never elected governor of California, Nixon joked with Haldeman. But events began to move quickly, and on April 30th of 1973, Nixon asked Haldeman and Ehrlichman to resign because of their role in the Watergate cover-up. Then that summer, the Justice Department reported that the allegations against Agnew had grown more serious. Even as vice president, Agnew had continued to take money for past favors, and he had received some of the payments in his White House office. Nixon had quipped that Agnew was his insurance against impeachment, arguing that no one wanted to remove him if it meant elevating Agnew to the presidency. The joke took on reality when Agnew asked House Speaker Carl Albert to request that the House conduct a full inquiry into the charges against him. Agnew reasoned that a vice president could be impeached but not indicted. That line of reasoning, however, also jeopardized the president. For over a century, since the failed impeachment of President Andrew Johnson, it had been commonly accepted reasoning that impeachment was an impractical impractical and inappropriate congressional tool against the presidency. Agnew's impeachment would set a precedent that could be turned against Nixon. A brief from the Solicitor General argued that While the president was immune from indictment, the vice president was not, since his conviction would not disrupt the workings of the executive branch. Agnew, a proud man filled with moral indignation, reacted to these arguments by digging in his heels and taking a stance 
that journalists described as aggressively defensive. He refused the initial suggestions from the White House that he resign voluntarily, after which Agnew believed that high-level officials launched a campaign to drive me out by leaking anti-Agnew stories to the media. Nixon had already heard on April 14th of 1973 during a meeting with Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman and Domestic Policy Advisor John Ehrlichman, Nixon was first given details of the investigation. This news settled on a White House that had long been bunkering itself against Watergate. Nixon made it clear that there would be no attempt made to cover up Agnew's transgressions. Left without White House support, it was only a matter of time before the press picked up the story. On August 6th, the Wall Street Journal called Agnew to tell him that it was running a story that reported that there was an investigation underway. That same day, Attorney General Elliot Richardson, who had been kept appraised of the investigation by Beale, met with Nixon and told him that Beale's case against Agnew was airtight. The next day, on August 7th, Nixon met with Agnew. The vice president emerged to report that the president supported him in his fight against charges that Agnew labeled damn lies. But Nixon's support never consisted of anything more than benign neglect. Watergate implicated White House aides, including Haldeman and Ehrlichman, had been allowed to resign. As Nixon was faced with investigations by both the Congress and a Justice Department special prosecutor, both of whom wanted to hear recordings from an Oval Office taping system. As Nixon fought the Battle of the Tapes, which had every indication, even as early as the summer of 1973, of being a fight that would find its way to the Supreme Court, Nixon clearly wanted to rid himself of Agnew as soon as was politically possible. Before the end of August, he sent Alexander Haig, Haldeman's replacement as chief of staff, to ask the vice president to resign. Agnew refused, holding out until mid-September September, when both Haig and White House counsel J. Fred Buzzhard told Agnew that he had no chance. Agnew's lawyer contacted Beale and the plea bargaining began. But when the Washington Post reported on September 22nd that bargaining had begun, a seething Agnew tried one more offensive. Ordering the plea bargaining to come to a halt, he demanded to be afforded the formal impeachment process before the House of Representatives. This terrified the administration. Once the impeachment process had been dusted off and tested, Agnew's case might well serve as a model for Nixon's own. Fortunately for Nixon, Speaker of the House Carl Albert refused to intervene. Agnew then tried one last gambit, arguing that the Constitution prevented a sitting vice president from being indicted for a crime. His lawyers filed a suit against the Justice Department, enjoining them not to turn over any further evidence to the grand jury. On October 4th, the court ruled that while a president was protected from indictment, a vice president was not. Agnew had no further legal avenues, and his attempt to garner public opinion had failed miserably. The country was Watergate weary. Both the president and the people wanted Agnew gone, and the vice president finally accepted the inevitable. On October 10th, Agnew appeared in a federal courtroom in Baltimore to plead no low contendor, no contest, to a charge of income tax evasion. He received a $10,000 fine and a three-year jail sentence, which was suspended immediately. 
Later that afternoon, Agnew delivered his resignation to Secretary of State Kissinger. On October 12th, Nixon announced that he would nominate Gerald Ford to replace Agnew under the terms of the 25th Amendment. Five days after his resignation, on October 15th, Agnew delivered a farewell address to the nation. It was vintage Agnew, as he continued to claim his innocence and to blame the media for his problems. In the national sigh of relief that followed the Ford nomination, Agnew's protests fell largely on deaf ears. While I'm fully aware that the plea of Nolo Contandri was the equivalent of a plea of guilty for the purpose of that negotiated proceeding in Baltimore, it does not represent a confession of any guilt whatever for any other purpose. I made the plea because it was the only way to quickly resolve the situation. In this technological age, image becomes dominant. Appearance supersedes reality. An appearance of wrongdoing, whether true in fa or false in fact, is damaging to any man. But more important, it is fatal to a man who must be ready at any moment to step into the presidency. If the American people deserve to have a vice president who commands their unimpaired confidence and implicit trust. For more than two months now, you have not had such a vice president. Had I remained in office and fought to vindicate myself through the courts and the Congress, it would have meant subjecting the country to a further agonizing period of months without an unclouded successor for the president. This I could not do despite my tormented verbal assertion in Los Angeles. To put his country through the ordeal of division and uncertainty that that entailed would be a selfish and unpatriotic action for any man in the best of times. But at this especially critical time, with a dangerous war raging in the Mideast, and with the nation still torn by the wrenching experiences of the past year, it would have been intolerable. So I chose instead not to contest formally the accusations against me. In the more than two decades after he left the vice presidency, a period that saw Agnew retreat into a retirement that did not include either an attempt to return to public office or to the public arena, Agnew continued to maintain his guiltlessness. In his memoirs, Go Quietly or Else, in 1980, Agnew widened his indictment to include Attorney General Richardson and Nixon himself. In May of 1995, the Republican-dominated Congress accorded Agnew an honor, which to that point, he had been the only vice president not to receive. His bust was included with the other vice presidents just outside Statutory, statutory Hall on the Senate side of the U.S. Capitol building in a ceremony that received a great deal of media attention. Spiro Agnew died on September 18th of 1996 at the age of 77 in a hospital in Berlin, Maryland. He was admitted with a previously undiagnosed a diagnosed case of acute leukemia and died within three hours. I will not resign if indicted. By September, September, it was a more desperate, less confident looking man who informed Nixon that he would consider resignation if granted immunity from prosecution. Nixon noted that in a sad and gentle voice, he asked for my assurance that I would not turn my back on him if he were out of office. Believing that for Agnew to resign would be the most honorable course of action, Nixon felt confident that when the vice president left for California shortly after their meeting, he was going away to think matters over and to prepare his family for his resignation. But in Los Angeles, fired up by an enthusiastic gathering of the National Federation of Republican Women, 
Agnew defiantly shouted, I will not resign if indicted. As Agnew later explained, he had spent the previous evening at the home of the singer Frank Sinatra, who had urged him to fight back. Nixon's new chief of staff and crisis manager, General Alexander M. Haig Jr., was haunted by the specter of a double impeachment of the president and vice president, which could turn the presidency over to congressional Democrats. General Haig therefore took the initiative in forcing Agnew out of office. He instructed Agnew's staff that the president wanted no more speeches like the one in Los Angeles. He further advised that the Justice Department would prosecute Agnew on the charge of failing to record on his income tax returns the cash contributions he had received. Haig assured Agnew's staff that if the vice president resigned and pleaded guilty on the tax charge, the government would settle the other charges against him and he would serve no jail sentence. But if Agnew continued to fight, it can and will get nasty and dirty. From this report, Agnew concluded that the president had abandoned him. The vice president even feared for his life, reading into Haig's message, Go quietly or else. General Haig similarly found Agnew menacing enough to alert Mrs. Haig that she, should he disappear, she may want to look inside any recently poured concrete bridge pilings in Maryland. A plea of no low contendery. Meanwhile, Agnew's attorneys had entered into plea bargaining with the federal prosecutors. In return for pleading no low contendery or no contest to the tax charge and paying $160,000 in back taxes with the help of a loan from Frank Sinatra, he would receive a suspended sentence and a $10,000 fine. On October 10th of 1973, while Spiro T. Agnew appeared in federal court in Baltimore, his letter of resignation was delivered to Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Agnew was only the second vice president to resign the office. John C. Calhoun had been the first. Prior to resigning, Agnew paid a last visit to President Nixon, who assured him that what he was doing was best for his family and his country. When he later recalled the president's gaunt appearance, Agnew wrote, It was hard to believe he was not genuinely sorry about the course of events. Within two days, this consummate actor would be celebrating his appointment of a new vice president with never a thought of me. Nixon still wanted to name John Connolly as vice president, but Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield intimidated that Congress would never confirm him. On October 12th, even as pictures of Agnew were being removed from federal offices around the country, Nixon appointed House Republican leader Gerald R. Ford as the first vice president to be selected under the 25th Amendment. Agnew was stunned by the laughter and gaiety of the televised event that seemed like the celebration of a great election victory, not the aftermath of a stunning tragedy. The coda to the Agnew saga occurred the following year as Nixon's presidency came to an end. In June of 1974, the besieged president dictated an entry in his diary in which he confronted the real possibility of impeachment. Nixon reviewed a series of decisions that now seemed to him mistakes, such as asking Haldeman and Ehrlichman to resign, appointing Elliot Richardson attorney general, and not destroying the secret tape recordings of his White House conversations. The Agnew resignation was necessary 
although a very serious blow, Nixon added, because while some thought his stepping aside would take some of the pressure off the effort to get the president, all it did was to open the way to put pressure on the president to resign as well. This is something we have to realize that any accommodation with opponents in this kind of a fight does not satisfy. It only brings on demands for more. On August 9th of 1974, Richard Nixon joined Spiro Agnew in making theirs the first presidential and vice presidential team in history to resign from office. Following his resignation, the vice president, who had made himself a household word, faded quickly into obscurity. Agnew moved to Rancho Mirage, California, where he became an international business consultant, tapping many of the contacts he had made with foreign governments on travels abroad as vice president. He published his memoir, ominously entitled, Go Quietly or Else, and a novel, The Canfield Decision, whose protagonist was a wheeling and dealing American vice president destroyed by his own ambition. For the rest of his life, Agnew remained largely aloof from the news media and cut off from Washington political circles. Feeling totally abandoned, he refused to accept any telephone calls from former President Nixon. When Nixon died in 1994, however, Agnew chose to attend his funeral. I decided after 20 years of resentment, to put it aside, he explained. The next year, Spiro Agnew's bust was at last installed with those of other vice presidents in the halls of the U.S. Capitol. I am not blind or deaf to the fact that there are those who feel this is a ceremony that should not take place, he acknowledged. Agnew died of leukemia on September 17th of 1996 in his home state of Maryland. And then just a few kind of interesting things uh, regarding Agnew. You know, of course, we don't even have to say it. Obviously, resign, the scandal, um, crazy stuff. Uh, Spiro Agnew, the Archie Bunker of the White House. Uh, Spiro Agnew preferred to be called Ted was a seemingly safe choice for Richard Nixon's running mate in 1968, mainly because he faded easily into the background. But once in office, Agnew thrust himself into the limelight by delivering a series of divisive speeches defending the Vietnam War and attacking peaceniks. Agnew became the crotchety Archie Bunker of the White House. He lambasted his enemies, peppering his rants with phrases such as Superstitious sophisticates, super, super sicilous, super sicilous, vi vicars of vacillation, uh, and pussyfooting. Uh, what else to say? Still, much of the country loved him. Um, women in front of thousands of screaming fans, many bearing Spiro is our hero signs. Um, all this kind of stuff, just crazy stuff regarding Hagdu. <laughs> Uh, I, this was kind of cool. Um, there was, uh, Spiro Agnew regarding, um, a classic song, Puff the Magic Dragon in 1962, the Peter Paul and Mary song. Uh, drug references was the reason. In 1970, Vice President Spiro Agnew described rock music as blatant drug culture propaganda and warned that it threatened to sap our national strength unless we move hard and fast to bring it under control. He immediately went on a crusade to ban songs that referred to drugs. This included the children's ditty, Puff the Magic Dragon, which would surely be harmless to anyone for whom it was written. Despite lyrics like Puff Dragon, Autumn Mist, Little Jackie Paper, and That's It Really, composer Peter Yarrow, always, always protested the song was merely an innocent fantasy with no hidden meaning. 
You like Peter, Paul, and Mary? Yes, I do. I'm a big fan. Great song. Yeah, one of my favorites. Who would have thought it wasn't really about a dragon, huh? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, the whole drug thing. No, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Some people uh, think that to puff the magic dragon means they're really to, um, to smoke, uh, smoke a marijuana cigarette. Well, Puff's just the name of the boy's magical dragon. Right. Are you a pothead, Farker? No, no. What? No, 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 Jack. No, I'm, I'm not. I, I pass on grass all the time. I mean, not all the time. Yes or no, Greg? No. But Agnew did not like it. Uh, very outspoken, as we know, Spiro Agnew. Um, what else here? Legacy, Agnew will forever be known for his rapid ascent from his obscurity to national prominence and his scathing attacks on the news media and on society and culture. He was critical of efforts to lift America's economically disadvantaged out of systemic poverty and of civil rights protesters in the tumultuous late 60s. He frequently used derogatory slurs such as, if you've seen one city slum, you've seen them all. Uh, so yeah. Very interesting. Um, famous quote from Agnew, in the United States today, we have more than our share of the nattering nabobs of negativism. They have formed their own 4-H club, the hopeless, hysterical, hypochondriacs of history. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, good old Spiro put his, put his foot in his mouth a lot. Uh, um, so we know about the vice presidency, you know, um, we know about the resignation. Uh, I'm not even going to go over the re-election of 1972 because, you know, it was very short-lived, him and Nixon, in their second term. Um, and it was a landslide. They, they won that, uh, that election handily. Um, soon after his resignation, Agnew moved to his summer home in Ocean City to cover urgent tax and legal bills and living expenses, he borrowed $200,000 from his friend Frank Sinatra. He had hoped he could resume a career as a lawyer, but in 1974, the Maryland Court of Appeals disbarred him, calling him morally obtuse. Um, he, he pursued other business interests, an un unsuccessful land deal in Kentucky, an equally fruitless partnership with golfer Doug Sanders over a beer distribution uh, ship in uh, Texas. You know, all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into every little thing here, uh, you know, that he did afterwards. Um, you know, we know about the books. Uh, final years in death for the remainder of his life. Agnew kept distance from news media and Washington politics, stating he felt totally abandoned. Um, we know about that with Nixon's death. Uh, Nixon's daughters invited Agnew to attend the funeral in Yorba Linda, California. At first he refused, still bitter, but then he accepted. A year later, Agnew appeared at the Capitol for the bust presentation. Um, on September 16th of 1996, Agnew collapsed at his summer home in Ocean City, Maryland. He was taken to Atlantic General Hospital where he died the following evening. The cause of death was undiagnosed acute leukemia. Agnew remained fit and active into his 70s, playing golf and tennis regularly, and was scheduled to play tennis with a friend on the day of his death. The funeral at Timonium, Maryland, was mainly confined to family. Buchanan and some of Agnew's former Secret Service detail also attended to pay their final respects. In recognition of his service as vice president, an honor guard of the combined military services fired a 21-gun salute at the graveside. 
Agnew's wife, Judith, survived him by 16 years, dying in Rancho Mirage on June 20th of 2012. At the time of his death, Agnew's legacy was perceived largely in negative terms. The circumstances of his fall from public life, particularly in the light of his declared dedication to law and order, did much to engender cynicism and distrust towards politicians of every stripe. His disgrace led to a greater degree of care in the selection of potential vice presidents. Most of the running mates selected by the major parties after 1972 were seasoned politicians, some of whom themselves became their party's nominee for president. Some recent historians have seen Agnew as important in the development of the new right, arguing that he should be honored alongside the acknowledged founding fathers of the movement such as Goldwater and Reagan. Victor Gold, Agnew's former press secretary, considered him the movement's John the Baptist. Goldwater's crusade in 1964 at the height of the Johnsonian liberalism came too early. But by the time of Agnew's election, liberalism was on the wane. And as Agnew moved to the right after 1968, the country moved with him. Agnew's fall shocked and saddened conservatives, but it did not inhibit the growth of the new right. Agnew, the first suburban politician to achieve high office, helped to popularize, popularize the view that much of the national media was controlled by elitist and effete liberals. Levy noted that Agnew helped recast the Republicans as a party of middle Americans and even in disgrace reinforced the public's distrust of government. For Agnew himself, despite his rise from his origins of Baltimore to next in line to the presidency, there could be little doubt that history's judgment was already upon him, the first vice president of the U.S. to have resigned in disgrace. All that he achieved or sought to achieve in his public life had been buried in that tragic and irrefutable act. Levy sums up the might have been of Agnew's career thus, It is not a far stretch to imagine that if Agnew had contested corruption charges half as hard as Nixon denied culpability for Watergate, as Goldwater and several other stalwart conservatives wanted him to, today we might be speaking of Agnew Democrats and Agnewnomics and deem Agnew the father of modern conservatism. So before I show a few photos of his gravesite, uh, let's take a look here at some video clips, audio clips, that sort of thing. I uh, simply said, Mr. President, I'm delighted to have the chance to serve again with you, and I'll do everything I can to see that we're reelected. Mr. Vice President, was there ever a time when you didn't think you were going to get it? Well, I guess everybody has moments of insecurity. Uh, from time to time, but uh, I never did really feel that I was in deep trouble, uh, you might say, as far as uh, the selection was concerned. But I think the important thing for me to emphasize here is that had I not been selected, I was very serious and sincere when I said I would still do everything I could to assist the re-election of the president. I am not uh, uh, the kind of person who, who goes into politics purely from a point of his own interest in holding elective office, and uh, I regard it as a service. Don't open this door. Don't open this door. What's the case, Regani? Ella, of course. Of course, it's a mess. 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 Ελάτε πιο πίσω λίγα. Πιο κάτω το φως, παιδιά. Όχι μέσα το φως, παιδιά. Τι κολλήσατε όλοι το πρώτο 
Congress and your guests. I thought when I came up here today I might seize upon the makeup of this organization to give what might be called a rather provocative speech on the relationship between architects and engineers to the political fundraising process. <laughs> But to focus on new construction as the primary way of helping low-income people get decent housing is to do three things. First of all, it deprives these people of their freedom of choice. Second, it is unacceptably expensive and wasteful. And third, because of the huge amount it would cost, it practically guarantees that we're never going to achieve the goal of decent housing for all. Precisely what President Nixon and all of us are certain we can achieve under this new housing policy. We welcome your consideration and your support. Thank you very much. Repeat after me. I, Spiro Theodore Agnew. I, Spiro Theodore Agnew. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign. Domestic, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservations. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office, the duties of the office on which 
I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. So help you God. So help me God. Recently, I have noticed a number of reports that unnamed associates or advisors of mine have commented about my reaction to the Watergate matter. Let me emphasize that I do not speak through such unidentified sources. Whenever I have something to say, I will say it directly, just as I'm doing now. At the outset, I want to make it very clear that I have full confidence in the integrity of President Nixon and in his determination and ability to resolve the Watergate matter to the full satisfaction of the American people. As to the case itself, beyond the fact that seven men were indicted, tried, and convicted of criminal acts, not much reliable information is currently available. We are inundated with rumor, hearsay, grand jury leaks, speculation, and statements from undisclosed sources. It's entirely possible that some of this may later prove to be accurate. If it is, it must be confronted forthrightly at that time. But the problem is that presently it is virtually impossible to separate fact from fiction. Jumping to conclusions before the evidence is in can adversely affect the integrity of our criminal investigative processes. I'm aware that pressure <clears throat> is being brought to bear on Republican office holders from the President on down to comment on this matter. And there is great temptation to comment, if only to make certain that the public understands that one does not condone illegal conduct. However, to speculate for such a self-serving purpose would be unfair to those under investigation who may subsequently be discharged by the grand jury. Equally important, careless comment might easily compromise the prosecution's position by prejudicing the right of a defendant to a fair trial. For these reasons, I will have nothing to say further on the substance of the matter at this time. I may have more to say later. Take a look at some videos right here. And there you go, guys. And last but not least, uh, his gravesite. It is in Timonium, Maryland, which is in Baltimore County. It's at the Delaney Valley Memorial Gardens. And boy, talk about just very modest, very average. There's nothing to it. As you see from a couple of my photos right here that I'm showing, just a flat, small marker on the ground. I mean, the day I was there, there was all these American flags, these little American flags around it, as you see in the picture. But, there, I mean, there's no... You could drive right by this and never have any idea that a former vice president is laid to rest here. I mean, it is very modest. So, unbelievable. So, there you have it, guys. Uh, stay tuned. Bonus footage. I will show you all of my photos to my visit uh, to Spiro Agnew's gravesite there in uh, Timonium, Maryland. Uh, but there you go. A look at the 39th Vice President of the United States, Spiro T. Agnew. The controversial and quite uh, crazy roller coaster ride of the Vice Presidency of Spiro Agnew. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for everything. Thank you for the support, the likes, the comments, the subscribes, all of it. Can't do this without you guys. Henry and I, thank you so much. It's been a blast. And, guys, stay tuned. Next week, we will take a look at Nelson Rockefeller, our next vice president. And that's it. I mean, after that, we only got one more. Two left. Two vice presidents left in our vice presidential series absolutely unbelievable so thanks so much guys uh stay tuned for that bonus footage of his gravesite and i will see you next week bye bye now